Word nerd. Wordsmith. Wordy. Wordless. Oxford Dictionary says a word is a single, distinct, meaningful element of speech or writing, used with others or sometimes alone. We say each one matters. No extra words is literature, minimalist style. And we're getting you right to the story. You got out of the car without looking at me. I registered with interest that you managed to not catch the seatbelt buckle in the door in your haste and drama and was impressed. I felt sure I would have. It did not occur to me to watch you go. Instead, I wondered how long it would be before I would have to restart the car to keep warm, and if you would return before then, or at all. Hello there! Welcome to No Extra Word, the Flash Fiction Podcast. My name is Chris Baker-Dirsch. I'm your producer and editor. We're kind of back in the saddle today. We're back to our usual format. We diverged a little bit during National Poetry Month to put some poetry alongside our short stories. And we're back with Margaret Adams' beautiful piece of microfiction. It is untitled. Microfiction sometimes is so light and delicate that a title weighs it down a little bit too much. Margaret Adams set a No Extra Words precedent today. She is the first ever contributor to appear on back-to-back episodes of the show. We shared her poem storage last week. So that was a fun first. Oh my gosh, you guys, so much has been going on with the show, I can't even tell you. In addition to the poetry, we've been doing special episodes, we've been doing Meet the Author episodes. Voting is now closed for our 50th episode favorite story poll and listener feedback, and all of that will be announced and put together for the 50th episode June 1st. So much going on, and I thought about doing a Mother's Day special, because this is an important holiday that we're coming up on, Mother's Day, for those of us in North America. Um, but I didn't, didn't have enough time to do it justice in and amongst everything else that we're doing on the show. So instead, we're going to bring you some stories about those mother relationships, about those special family relationships, both this week and then next week, the two episodes that sandwich Mother's Day. That starts right now with The Mother Party by Rachel Lyon, which is a little bit of a long story for us, but well worth every minute of listening. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there, and we will see you next week here on No Extra Words. The week my mother died, I hosted a party. The funeral had been small. She was a weird woman. She didn't have many friends. Regardless, I planned the festivities soon enough after her death that most of my second- and third-tier acquaintances wouldn't yet know she was gone. That made it easier. I was 28, grown up enough that even if they had known, they probably wouldn't have suspected me of holding auditions. It was, after all, the sort of thing a poorly brought-up child might do. And although I was poorly brought up, By the time you're in your 20s, no one really expects you to act like a child anymore. A 28-year-old woman is expected to take in stride that the dead can't be replaced. But I saw my mother's death as an opportunity. I'd been intending to replace her for years. My biological mother had left me an inheritance. Supplementing with my own personal income, I had enough to pay about 50 k a year for 10 years. In 10 years, I would be almost 40, At 40, I imagined, I'll be more or less weaned. I decided it would be best if the replacement were hired on a probational basis. A nine-month trial period would be followed by a binding two-year commitment. During that time, she would be required to perform all the substantive motherly duties, e.g. hosting holidays, giving birthday presents, calling just to check in, and meet a list of predetermined emotional needs, e.g. listening to me vent at the end of the day, giving interpersonal advice. For the sake of the contract, I wrote up a list. As it's rather exhaustive, I won't include it here. At the end of two years, my new mother's performance would be evaluated. Together, we'd re-examine the program. Necessary changes would be made. Age wasn't really a factor. Obviously, the ideal candidate would be at least 20 years older than me. But if a nurturing woman in her late 30s applied for the job, I'd definitely consider her. Character was the real key. In the end, 
the list of criteria was simple and short. One, candidates would be even-keeled, self-possessed, with a good sense of humor, humble and sane. Disqualified, for example, was a certain ex-babysitter who tickled me once till I cried. My Aunt Theodora also did not make the cut. She once burst into tears watching a commercial for Cheerios. Two, as I knew I could not predict whether they'd ever truly love me, I'm not crazy, understand. Candidates had to demonstrate at least some vested interest in me. I am an interesting person, so that criterion is not too hard to meet, but it did disqualify a few otherwise acceptable prospects. An otherwise dignified woman I'd sat beside once on a plane, for example, who pretended to fall asleep in the middle of a story about an ex-boyfriend who broke up with me the day before Valentine's Day. Three, candidates would be childless. I wasn't interested in any new brothers or sisters. Invitations to the party required some research. For instance, I wanted to invite my fourth grade teacher, Miss Elizabeth, but I didn't know her last name. So I had to call the school, where an administrative assistant told me she'd gone to work at another school, and then I had to call that school, and they told me she was out on maternity leave. Disqualified. I wanted to invite the woman with the dreadlocks who reads in the community garden on Sundays, but I knew nothing at all about her, and she wasn't there the afternoon I went by. I was able to track down Sandy Moffat, hard, tough Sandy, who used to drive the yellow bus I took to elementary school. I had always treasured how, one time, she pulled over, stomped down the aisle, and humiliated Andrew Martin. She picked him right up by the nape of the neck like a kitten, and demanded point-blank to know why I was crying. From her poorly curated MySpace page, I could see she looked about the same, though she'd gained a little weight. If anything, the extra pounds added to her impressiveness. She was even more strong and robust than I remembered. Her expression was stoic. Her shoulders were square and broad. I sent Sandy a note explaining who I was. I admitted she might not remember me. I told her the time and the place to be, my apartment, Saturday night at 8. I said it was a potluck. I said it was very important to me. I didn't say that the potluck was part of the test. Next, I looked up Melanie Ortiz, the round-faced young secretary who used to work at my father's office. When my mother would haul me in with her to ream out my dad for something or other, Melanie and I would eat M&Ms and play jigsaw puzzles, ignoring the yelling behind my dad's closed office door, laughing as we tried to fit the pieces together. Melanie had a wonderful laugh. When I looked her up on the company website, I found she still worked there. She'd moved up through two mergers, three new offices. I called her directly and reminded her who I was. She seemed glad to be invited. I called up my mother's estranged friend, Angela, a woman with reserved Midwestern manners who must have been put off by mom's erratic behavior. I invited her, too. I invited Mathilde, my college French professor, who drank loose tea and took an interest in me despite my lousy conjugations. I invited Marcy Jones, a former co-worker who once set me up on a date with her nephew, and Jane Priestley, who'd long ago married and divorced an alcoholic cousin of mine, and buxom Chatty Dina, who'd been my tour guide on a ten-day trip through Turkey when I was nineteen. The invitation list ended up being remarkably long. There were just so many women who would have made better mothers than my own mother did. A few of the candidates couldn't make it, of course, but most of those sent their regrets. A good sign. Marcy Jones arrived heavy and full of real laughter, ready to mingle with a bottle of wine. Angela arrived a little nervous, with crudité. She must have thought my mother would be there. With a look of concern, she said to me, "'How's your mom, then?' I nodded and smiled and introduced her to Mathilde, who was wearing a scarf tied just so at the throat." Susan, who owns the bakery around the corner from me, brought a paper bag of pastries. Teresa, my Italian neighbor, brought anise cookies and schnapps. Tattooed Cynthia, who works at my favorite bar, didn't bring anything, but talked with the other guests as easily as an old friend. Melanie Ortiz, the ex-secretary, showed up with lasagna she cooked herself under aluminum foil and Pyrex. When she hugged me, she smelled like Pantene. She was so young. I was surprised and told her so. 
She said she'd been just barely 20 when we ate M&Ms and played jigsaw puzzles so many years ago. I asked her if she was married now, if she had kids. She said no and pulled into the lead. I talked my way through the crowd, buoyed by anticipation. I planned to ask each of the guests a few questions right off the bat to get a sense of their qualifications. You can tell right away if a person is poised and engaged, but it takes time to gauge whether or not she is sane. Then, of course, there's the question of health. One mother dying had been quite enough. I asked each of them, How have you been? And then, Any serious illnesses run in your family? I followed grave topics with lighter conversation. In a way that I'm sure seemed fun, if a little ironic, I asked each of them how they'd been sleeping, whether they'd recently experienced any loss of appetite, any mood swings. Finally, I steered the dialogue around to their children. If they had any, mentally, I crossed them off my list. Cynthia left after just 45 minutes, closely followed by Jane, Susan, and Teresa. I was sorry to see them go until it occurred to me that their leaving early was, in itself, a mark of ineligibility. My new mother would have to be available when I wanted her. Marcy Jones and Dina, the tour guide, chatted easily by the crudité. I joined them with a pleasant expression, but my face must have fallen when it turned out they were comparing horror stories about dating. That was not a mark in their favor. I wanted a mother, but I had no need for a rotating cast of father figures coming in and out of my life like understudies who did not know their lines. That left three. Melanie Ortiz, Mathilde the French professor, and Sandy the bus driver, whom I'd lost track of somehow. Melanie and Mathilde were talking together on the love seat. I pulled up an ottoman and joined them. What are you talking about? I asked. My tone was playful and friendly. They looked uncomfortable. Melanie said, well, about you. I smiled. I said, I thought I felt my ears burning. They laughed without laughing. Melanie put a hand on my hand. She said, we're worried about you. I smiled harder. Why? I asked. Melanie leaned forward. We know your mother died, sweetie. Mathilde said, we're so sorry. I felt my smile becoming a grimace. How did you find out? Melanie held up her galaxy. There was my mother's Facebook page, her wall clotted with reminiscences. What could I do? I was determined to remain cheerful. I said, well, so there you go. The position is open. They exchanged a look I found difficult to read. Melanie stood up too. She was a wonderful woman, she said. She seemed to mean it. Not really, I said loudly. Not really at all. You're a wonderful woman. I turned to Mathilde. You're a wonderful woman. Sandy's a wonderful woman, wherever she is. All of you would do a much better job than she did. So, I got up. I was a little dizzy. I had the upsetting feeling my cover had been blown. There's no paper application or anything, I told them, but I'll be holding interviews as soon as possible. I would like to have the position filled by the end of the month. I found Sandy alone, outside on the porch, smoking. It was chilly, and she had her hat pulled down hard over her ears. I went out through the screen door to join her. Behind me, I could feel Mathilde and Melanie watching me. I stood with Sandy a moment, looking out at the empty road, the dark woods. Weird party, she said at last. I said, cigarettes shorten your lifespan by an average of 6.5 years. She squinted and exhaled. When it comes to life, she said, I value quality over quantity. The door opened, and Melanie and Mathilde slipped out. Thanks for having us, Melanie said to me. It was great to see you again. You've grown into a real woman. Mathilde kissed both of my cheeks. Cherie, she said, pour toi bien. Sandy and I watched them walk together down the path toward the road and part and get in their respective cars. Can I bum one? I asked her. Sandy held out the pack. I put a cigarette in my mouth and leaned toward her so she could light it for me. When I inhaled, I coughed. You are right there, cowgirl, she said. I nodded. I took a breath. I tried to regain my composure. She flicked her cigarette butt at the road. She leaned back and looked me up and down. I remember you, she said at last. You were kind of a shrimp, weren't you? Yeah, I said. 
Yeah, she said, I remember you. Your mother's a loon. I smoked quietly, my eyes crossing a little as I watched the cherry glow. I don't remember most parents, but I remember her. Sandy laughed, and her voice was dusty and thick. How could I forget a woman who chased me down in a parking lot? She chased you down? Chased us down. Chased the bus. She was worried about you. She wanted me to look out for you. As if I didn't look out for all you kids. As if I didn't know how to do my job. My cigarette was burning down to the filter. I didn't want it to go out. She told me you were fragile, Sandy said. Fragile was the word that she used. It's a real problem, in my opinion, when parents think their kids are fragile. Kids are resilient. They can eat dirt, break their legs, they'll be fine. It's adults who get cancer, osteoporosis, rheumatoid arthritis. She rubbed her neck and grimaced as if it hurt. I wanted to ask her if she was all right. I wanted to ask if she had any daughters, if there was room for me somewhere in her solitary bus driver's life. I wanted to beg her to make macaroni and cheese and sit with me at the kitchen table, playing go fish and smoking through sunrise. Instead, I said, so she was looking out for me. Sandy looked at me funny, her hand still gripping the back of her neck. She said, of course she was, honey. Thanks for listening to the No Extra Words podcast. For more information on today's stories and contributors, or to learn how to submit your own work, please visit us at noextrawords.wordpress.com. The best support you can give the show is to recommend us to your family and friends. See you next time.